uh, for much of my life. Why is there a difference, a mark with the name and a mark with the number? And then suddenly it struck me in preparing for this. It struck me that the name signifies character. And therefore, the name of the beast would represent the forehead, the character of those who follow. There'll be those who embrace the name of the beast, the identity of the beast as their own. They're marked with the name on the forehead. Those who simply go along out of fear or self-interest, uh, they are marked with a number on the hand. Uh, it is simply something that they do, not something that they truly believe in heart. Satan doesn't care why you worship him as long as you do. It's about him, about his power, about his control, and if he can control you, he doesn't care whether you care. That's what I see here in these two types of mark. The forehead representing character and the hand representing the action, the name and the number representing those two types of response. So what is this mark of the beast? Uh, it's interesting that Sunday laws are seen as critical to Revelation 13, yet the word Sunday isn't here. In fact, the word Sabbath isn't in the book of Revelation either. So how can one come to a text like this and draw the kinds of conclusions that Seventh-day Adventists have drawn in the past? Well, it starts with observing what is in contrast to the mark. The mark of the beast is in contrast to the seal of God. Clearly those concepts are in tension with each other, just as the counterfeit trinity of Revelation 13, dragon, beast, and false prophet, uh, is counter to the true trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you have the mark of the beast is in some way contrasting with the seal of God. And the seal of God is most clearly expressed in Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3, where the people of God are sealed on their foreheads. And then Revelation 14, verse 1, where they have the name of God on their foreheads. The same contrast, uh, the forehead, uh, the name, uh, the seal, the mark, uh, these are strongly in contrast with each other. So the mark of the beast is somehow in contrast with the seal of God. In the New Testament, generally, the seal of God is associated with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13, uh, Ephesians 4.30, that the Holy Spirit enters a person when they receive Jesus Christ, and the seal is the ever-developing character in harmony with the character of Christ and the character of God. The Holy Spirit is the active agent of God to work out his character in us. And it reminds me of a statement that Ellen White makes that the seal of God at the end will be settling into the truth. I think that concept is so critical. Let's take a look at that statement. It's uh, found in the book Last Day Events uh, and also uh, is quoted in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary where Ellen White said, the seal of God is not any seal or mark that can be seen. Remember the spiritualizing of the type? It's not a mark that can be seen. It's not going to be a brand. It's not going to be a microchip as such. But notice what she says. It is a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved. People who are so convinced, so committed, that no matter what happens, they cannot be moved. They cannot be deterred from their mission. Here we see once again, the contrast is the mark of the beast is the settling into the truth about Satan. Settling into a false concept of what God is like. And you become like the kind of God that you worship. So the mark of the beast has a lot to do with the character of those who will in the end reject God at the end of time. You see, in the book of Revelation, there are three types of people. And I will illustrate that with three boxes that you will see on the screen. First of all, you have what Revelation calls 
the saints, the remnant, the 144,000, the great multitude, the kings of the east, those who watch and keep on their garments and so forth. You have a number of names for the saints in the book of Revelation. And these are those who are becoming so settled into the truth, they cannot be moved. These saints are committed to God and they begin to find each other all around the world. It is that gathering, invisible gathering perhaps, in which God's true people are more and more marked off away from everyone else. In contrast with that, is a worldwide confederacy of religion at the end of time. And that confederacy is also known by many names like Babylon, the great city, the great prostitute, the unholy trinity, uh, the woman of Revelation 17. So you have a worldwide religious alliance. And in that worldwide religious alliance, a people are committed to the truth about God as seen through the eyes of Satan, as seen in that direction. Third, the third type of people are secular people, people who are neither committed to the truth, neither sealed by God, nor committed to the mark on the forehead, committed to the whole deal. These are called Euphrates River, kings of the world, many waters, kings of the earth, earth dwellers, beasts, ten horns, and so forth. So as you work through the final events in the book of Revelation, uh, you can see that uh, these three types of people are all there. Two of them end up receiving the mark, and one of these groups ends up not. They receive the seal of God instead. So the mark of the beast is an identifying mark of those who have rejected the gospel, rejected the truth about God, and follow a different a path. In Ezekiel, the seal is also a mark of protection. Those who receive the seal of God are not harmed by the judgments that occur. Similarly, those who receive the mark of the beast are not harmed by the beast's actions against its opponents. It's a protection from uh, the actions of the beast. But perhaps most interesting of all for us is the question that I raised briefly earlier. If neither Sabbath nor Sunday appears in the book of Revelation, why do Seventh-day Adventists see them as central? I would start by pointing out Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the fourth commandment uh, has language in there that speaks about God, uh, speaks about who, uh, how he became our God, made heaven and earth the territory over which he rules. And this reminds us again of Deuteronomy 6, the forehead and the hand. It is the Ten Commandments that are to be placed in the forehead and the hand. And of those Ten Commandments, the Sabbath one is particularly a seal. An interesting piece behind this is that Revelation 13 has the beast, the dragon, and the image of the beast all uh, counterfeiting the first table of the law of God. For example, the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. But in Revelation 13, people are called to worship the beast. The second commandment says, don't set up any image to worship. But the beasts set up an image and command to be worshipped. The third commandment says, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. The beast is full of the names of blasphemy. You see how each of the first three commandments is counterfeited. Therefore, it should not surprise us that the fourth commandment is also counterfeited in the concept of the seal of God versus the mark of the beast. Sabbath is often called a seal in the Old Testament. So the Sabbath seal becomes the center of the covenant. The beast is setting up a counterfeit covenant, a counterfeit gospel. 
that the people of God are resisting. Revelation 14, 7, and this is the key. It's the key text in this whole section. And notice what it says. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea. Where do we just see that language? Exodus 20, verse 11, the fourth commandment. The contrast between seal of God and mark of the beast ends up coming together in terms of the fourth commandment. The very last stage of earth's history is a call to worship the true God in a quotation of the fourth commandment. Does the book of Revelation ever use the word Sabbath? No, it does not. But at the crucial center point of the final crisis is a call to worship God in the language of the fourth commandment. That's the way Revelation works. Whenever possible, John does not speak literal direct language, but uses symbols and uses allusions to the Old Testament to build the case and build the story. If the seal of God, if the worship on Sabbath is crucial to the final gospel message, then its opposite, the mark of the beast, must have something similar to do. Now here I want to just mention something. In passing, the difference between an exegetical argument being compelling and defensible. If Revelation used the language Sabbath and Sunday and so on and stated things exactly the way Adventists have stated them in the past, it would be exegetically compelling. Nobody could read the text and say otherwise. But because the language is more subtle than that, and that's typical of classical prophecy, and sometimes even of apocalyptic prophecy. Uh, Instead of compelling, the bottom line is it needs to be defensible. A position that the church takes, that is committed to, should not contradict Scripture. And what we are seeing is that the concept of Sabbath and counterfeit is central to the book of Revelation as one sees it in the eyes of the illusions in Revelation 14.7. It is defensible to say that the Sabbath is a crucial issue in the final crisis. I believe it's also defensible to say that about Sunday as well. Let's take a look. There are four options for a counterfeit of the Sabbath that the mark of the beast is. How, if the mark of the beast is some counterfeit of the Sabbath, how would that work itself out? Four options. Number one, It could be another day, and Sunday would be an example of that other day. That one way to counterfeit the Sabbath is to set up the worship of a different day. It's a very compelling option, and it's the one that the Adventist pioneers chose. Another option is every day is a Sabbath. If you say that every day is a Sabbath, then the seventh day does not have the unique impact that it did before. Another option is to say no day is a Sabbath. And to simply say, you know, that was abolished at the cross, and so, you know, you, you, know, you, do, uh, you worship on the day that you think best. Uh, we'll worship on Sunday because it's convenient, and, uh, and so forth. The fourth option is to forbid Sabbath keeping itself. That one option for countering the centrality of Sabbath at the end Uh, would be legislation to forbid people from worshiping on the Sabbath day. These are options that are all defensible from the biblical text. Seventh-day Adventists have focused in on Sunday as the most likely uh, one of these because of uh, our own studies and our history. And we'll come to that, particularly the writings of Ellen White, in the next part of this presentation. So... In conclusion, we've taken a look at the principles of prophetic interpretation, seen how they work themselves out in Revelation 13. And in the final part of this series, we will take a look at the key statements in the writings of Ellen White that have led Seventh-day Adventists to take the positions that they have taken on Sunday legislation at the end of time. And I look forward to sharing that with you later.
Thank you, Dr. Pauline. Uh, I enjoyed that. We went down the roads of history and just dusted off the pages of those history books and gained an understanding of how Adventists traditionally understood the Sunday Law theme. We're looking forward to the next topic of the coming Sunday Law and how it's progressing from how we traditionally viewed it to what's possible. How could it be? It was an inspiring message and we thank you for it. We realize that you're busy and we do appreciate you're taking time out to share this with us. I also want to thank you, our audience, for sharing your precious time with us. We do take your time seriously, and we hope and pray that these pre presentations were a blessing to you. Please don't miss tonight's presentation, the final one. I'm so sad that this is ending, but we've got to draw a line somewhere. So join us tonight for the final presentation, once again from Dr. Pauline on the National Sunday Law. Goodbye, see you then.